This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to episode 251 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. You can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, You can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Pat Sweet, and he is an engineering and leadership uh, expert, one of the, uh, I guess, colleagues in this uh, this field that we have here, um, and he's been working in uh, complex engineering for about 15 years, including doing uh, launching the uh, Engineering and Leadership Project, which is, when I heard about it, I was super excited to find out more and to learn more about it. He's also um, uh, PMP certified, which is awesome because project management is an extremely important skill that all good technical leaders need, so uh, with with all that being said, Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are today in your career and uh, what is it that you're doing? Yeah, you bet. So I started my career as a, a bread and butter electrical engineer, uh, studied electrical engineering at, at the undergraduate level and got into building and facilities design, you know, uh, mm-hmm. sizing circuit breakers and cables and that kind of thing. Really the, the kind of stuff that you kind of think you're going to do uh, when you're an undergraduate electrical engineer. Uh, but pretty soon I, I migrated into what's called systems engineering. So I got it, uh, got in with a company called Bombardier, who at the time was a big, uh, the, the world's largest train manufacturer. And the particular group that I was with was the systems division. So this group would come into a city that had no rail infrastructure and could plunk down uh, a full turnkey transit system power supply distribution, the tracks, the trains, the stations, everything. And what was cool about that was that for systems that complex, there's actually a layer of engineering that has to happen way before any, anyone goes to that detailed level where you're sizing the circuit breakers and the cables and and all that, because when you're talking about a, a system that complex with that many subsystems interfacing, that is safety critical, um, you really have to think through how you're going to approach it before unleashing teams of engineers to do the detailed design. Uh, so that was a, a phenomenal experience. And I got into pr- product management and project management in, in that role as well. Eventually became chief engineer for, for our products, uh, which included a monorail, which a lot of people get excited about, um, a- automated driverless monorails and trains. So re- really sophisticated stuff that show up, show up to the station automatically, no driver, the doors open automatically, people get in, it takes itself to the next station, it, it next, you know, next generation type stuff. Uh, from there, I moved on to the defense industry, uh, working in, uh, in, in naval shipbuilding and it's very different environment, very different uh, mission and different customers, but, but the same fundamental technical issues. You're talking about pulling together systems, phenomenally complex systems built in all four corners of the globe and bringing them together to try to get them to do what you need a ship to do, as opposed to just a bunch of ship parts. <laughs> and those are two two very different things. Yeah, I know um, my uh, my brother-in-law actually works in uh, shipbuilding, and uh, he's probably listening. I know he listens to the show sometimes. So shout out to Jeremy um, at Norfolk. Uh, so, and it, it's really cool to hear some of the stories about like the things that when they go on like a, a nuclear ship or something like that, and all the all the stuff that goes into that, and how security is when it comes to military ships and things like that. It's really really interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt fact- that. No, no, no. But, but it's true. It's true. And, and thinking through things like how are you going to communicate technical data across national borders mm, in a yeah. safe way, in a legal way, so that you can facilitate the design? You know, there, there's, there's this whole level of thinking that has to happen if even just to get started in, in a design project like that. So, so really cool stuff. Learned a lot through that. Um, again, 
project management, systems engineering management, people management. Uh, I was head of a department called uh, configuration management, which which in the software world, I think I think uh, you would understand CM and the per the importance yeah. of version control and, and all that stuff. So uh, it, it exposed to a ton of different things, and at, at some point, I realized through all this that what I got really excited about was as exciting as the technology was, what I got really excited about was getting a team to really hum, to get a team to, to operate at a high level and to work hard together and to achieve goals. And I realized what I was most passionate about was, was the, the leadership aspect of engineering, mm -hmm. facilitating excellence in engineering. And this new chapter in my, in my career, um, I started a business called the Engineering and Leadership Project. And the, the, whole, the whole point of that is to equip engineers and technical leaders with the skills that they need to thrive. And I, I'm sure you've seen this in your own career, all too often technical people get kind of pushed into management roles, either because you know uh, they're, they're, there's a random vacancy, someone bailed, someone moved on. So you look around the room and you pick the best engineers. Say, okay, you, you're really good. You're gonna be the manager now. And, and that engineer normally is excited because it's a promotion, maybe they get an office, they get a, a raise. So of course they're going to take it just to find out they don't know anything about management and being a good engineer, a good technician is not the same as being a good manager. And it, it, it really perplexes me that we do this and we do this all the time. We, we never take a good manager and say, man, you, you're a really good manager. Let's make you the next uh, senior engineer. Yeah, <laughs> we would never do that. Yeah. So, so why why do we allow ourselves to go the other way? Um, so the the whole idea is to to help smooth that transition and really equip people with the with the tools, the skill set, the mindset to thrive in leadership roles. Because I I do think technical people absolutely can become great leaders. It's just not fair to expect that that transition will be automatic. It doesn't yeah, doesn't I, make any sense to me. That's the, that's basically like my story in a nutshell. You know. Um, I was, you know, working on a team where we were, you know, a software development group and, you know, the manager that was on the team left, they promoted me into becoming the manager of that team. And, and I sucked at it. <laughs> I was just terrible because <laughs> I assumed that, you know, uh, I think part of being, I hate to stereotype uh, software engineers here, but um, being the fact that I am one, I think I can a little bit. Sometimes when we're good at being a software developer, we, we get a little bit of an ego and sometimes that ego makes us think that we can do whatever we uh, want to do when it comes to being a manager and that people should do the things that we want, the way that we want them to do it. And it turns out that that's terrible for creativity. It's terrible for mm -hmm. team building. It's terrible for leadership in general. Um, but I found out pretty quickly that I'm not good at this manager thing and I need to figure it out. Um, and it was the same thing where like a company, they, they take someone who's good at one thing and put them in a role that's completely, although it sounds similar, you know, managing the, the software engineers, it sounds like it's part of the same thing. But it's totally not. It's a different skill set altogether. I'm not, you know, now I'm I'm developing people and not writing code, and it's, it's two totally different things. So Absolutely. having to learn that skill set was was challenging, and uh, and difficult. But I, I'm really glad to hear that you're working on solving that problem for for companies and individuals that they get find themselves in the same situation that I was in. Yeah, that that's the hope anyway. Having having that that technical grounding, I think, is critical. I, I don't think you can just grab someone from the street and say, "Okay, go go manage this engineering team." I think understanding the tech, the tech is really important. A to be you know respected as a leader. Yes. Not that you have to be the smartest guy in the room. You don't, but you have to know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, you have to be able to speak to know, the language, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And to know when you are hitting your limit of mm. of technical knowledge and when to defer to a subject matter expert make that make that call that's an important decision to be able to make and without any kind of technical grounding you're you're, you're going to flub it for sure so when, when you are an engineering uh manager or, or leader and you kind of have to step back some from doing the day-to-day -day, you know technical work and focus more on like developing the people how do you keep those technical chops because i think one of the saddest things to see is someone who was a really good uh engineer they got promoted into management and they kind of lost, they stopped learning. They stopped learning about the new technologies coming out. You know, you talked about the, uh, you know, the, the driverless, you know, uh, monorail. And, and let's say they've never heard of that because they didn't stay current. They didn't learn about it. And someone proposes and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, how, do you, how do you do both? How do you, how do you grow people, learn about the leadership part, as well as keeping your technical chops? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I think there's a balance to be struck. And I think that there's a decision that you need to make at mm -hmm. some point and, um, and decide, you know, do you want to go, do you want to go deep or do you want to go broad? And I think for the most part, if you've made the call that your, your career, your future is in management, that's yeah. great. That's great. It doesn't mean leaving the technology, but that, that means changing your relationship to it. And mm -hmm. what it probably means is going broad. So I, I still absolutely think you should be going to conferences. You should be a member of you know, the technical societies that are relevant to you, whether it's IEEE or, or any, anything else. Um, you should be reading. You should be listening to podcasts. You probably should not worry so much about you know going to code camps <laughs> and that kind of thing because right. you know once you once you delve into the particulars on that kind of thing it, you start to get it in your head that you're the one who should be doing x and, and and frankly you probably shouldn't be coding much if at all D depending on the nature of your role and especially in smaller companies okay. um everyone has to wear every hat and and that's a little bit different especially for, for medium to large size firms, you, your mission in life now as a leader is to get great work done through others. Yeah, that's the point. I, I agree with that 100%. And I, one thing I do want to add is like, um, so for me, what I found is that I couldn't code at work anymore, because it didn't make sense. It wasn't the best use of my time. It was detrimental to my team if I tried to, you know, not because I couldn't do it. It was because it, it was taking away from something that was far more important. You know, mm -hmm. as, as a leader, I don't scale as a coder, you know, I scale as leading people. But what I found that, that was really helpful for me is to take on side projects outside of work, whether it be um, like most recently, um, I helped build an app for a friend that has a, a devotional for teens that she wanted to, to put out there. So, okay, well, I'll code the, I'll code the app and build that Great. for you. That way I can keep my skill set a little bit sharp. I can, I can continue to, to learn about the changes that happen in Xcode and whatever else is going on technology wise, um, which helps me you know speak to my team about stuff in, in certain ways and understand what's going on with them. But I don't bring down the company by um, not being efficient. Yeah. And I, I guess I would say if, if you're super concerned mm -hmm. about not losing the technical skills, you've got to ask yourself an important question. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's and that's why. Is it because you think someday you're going to go back to that? Is it, you know, are you, Man. is it that you just can't quite let go? You know, what's the, what's the mindset behind that? Because the answering that is going to tell you what you need to do next with your career. Yeah. I can tell you that I'm not going to go back. Um, I've, I've crossed that threshold where I don't think I could be successful going back or I could, but it, it wouldn't be fun anymore, you know, but I feel like it's, it's one of those things I don't want to, it's almost like my, I have a little bit of an identity behind it, you know? And I don't want to give up that part of my life. <laughs> I feel yeah. like if I, if I stop doing it, I'll be the old guy that can't figure out how to use the uh, the remote. You know, <laughs> I don't want to be yeah. that. Or yeah. the old guy yeah. who asked me, kid, like, how do I do this thing with the app? How do I send that text message? <laughs> so. Well, I guess I guess the way the way I think about that is, you know, there's no way. It, think think for a moment about the CEO of any of any company yeah. of any size. There's no way that that person could possibly understand how to do every job within their company. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. So they, they've dedicated themselves to leading and developing people who can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think in my mind anyway, that's where I've decided to pivot to. And that that's given me permission to not be stressed out quite so much anymore about the fact that, you know, I'm not a wizard with SysML and model-based systems engineering. I, I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I know why model-based systems engineering is important in my world. And I know what a good uh, block definition diagram looks like. I'm not going to be the guy behind the console putting it together. And, and I think, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think that's been an important thing for me to wrap my head around is that that's okay, because I am focused on something else, which is enabling the people who have chosen to focus on that do killer work. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's a that it's a phenomenally difficult thing to wrap your head around for people who have spent a ton of time and a ton of money and a ton of energy developing those skills in the first place. It's it, it's a sunk cost fallacy, right? You you look back at all the time and energy you've put in, and you think, well, I can't leave it now. Well, you, in fact, you can make whatever decision you want today to move forward. You know, you can't. Nothing you decide today 
is going to affect the decision you made yesterday. Right. So right, yeah. yeah, I think I think a lot of us get get kind of hung up on that. And and listen, that's not that's not to say you shouldn't code on the weekends and, and build projects. If that's something you find you're passionate about and you're excited about, awesome. <laughs> There's you know that that's that's good. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100. Uh, of one of the things that uh, you you mentioned this when you're talking about like you know being part of memberships and going to conference. Did, did you find for you like when you got the management? track going to a conference you had a different experience you were you're going there for different reasons than when you were a developer or engineer going there uh i mean i mean what do you what do you try to get out of, of a conference now as a manager versus when you were an engineer yeah it's a good question i mean i mean part of it part of what changed is which conferences i got interested in yeah right so i'm now a member of the, the american society for engineering management that's something that that is interesting to me now that when i was uh, younger, earlier in my mm -hmm. career was not was not on my radar. I got my PMP now, a member of PMI. That wasn't as interesting earlier in my career. So the focus is is more toward um, ideas and introductions. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in meeting people. I'm interested in uh, interactions just like this, talking to other people who are passionate in the field and have big ideas about it. Whereas before, it might have been more about attending tutorials and technical tracks, wanting to learn how to use, you know, I, I remember there was, a, there was a conference on energy management and that was part of my role in my first, my very first job was uh, building modeling and energy consumption modeling. So I wanted to learn that software. I wanted to learn the processes. Uh, now I'm much more interested in, in the, the bigger picture stuff and the people who are pushing the state of the art with respect to managing teams and projects yeah so um what are some of the things so like you, you mentioned shifting those what, what are some of the things that you've gotten out of that um you know the, the pmi uh, organization and going through that that has helped you when it comes to leading and managing engineering projects hmm. i mean i guess one of the things that was most useful in in pursuing the 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 pmp and being part of pmi is in how i think about projects and, and probably the most the most important thing that has come out is is in how I think about change in projects. So if you if you write your PMP exam, you you write the or you read the PMBOK, one of the things that that comes up is the the importance of baselines, right? Understanding your baseline project scope, product scope, budget schedule, etc., mm -hmm. and having that set in stone, so that when the project invariably changes, you know, either a new requirement is added to the, uh, to, to the product that you're, you're looking to develop, or you take on scope, work scope that maybe was supposed to go to a partner, whatever, understanding in your head what, what constitutes a change and what kinds of things you have to think about when you recognize a change, particularly to product and project scope, um, helps you evaluate the, the goodness or badness <laughs> of that change, right? Because yeah. stuff gets thrown at you all the time in a project, particularly in a leadership role, and you've got to and you've got to deal with it. And and having kind of your spidey senses tingle in the right moments is super important. And and that's what that's what PMI's provided is that mental framework for thinking about the interconnectivity of the way a project works mm -hmm. to know, okay, yeah, this is going to be a problem. Right, you've you've changed this line in this contract over here. I've got eighteen vendors who I know I have that same line built in back to back, and I floated it down to them, and this is going to be a nightmare, right? Yeah. Whereas the placement of a comma before maybe <laughs> it didn't didn't matter, it didn't occur to you to 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 worry about it so much. Um, so yeah, su super super helpful from that perspective. Awesome. And well, what do you encourage or what, what do you find like is one of the biggest struggles that a new engineer or new engineering manager kind of f suffers from? Like what is, what is one of the things that they're going to that you expect to see people struggle with when they first become promoted from being, you know, a hardcore engineer to now managing a bunch of engineers? Uh, what, what is that one thing that you see over and over again? Yeah, I, I would say letting go mm -hmm. and delegation. And the two, the two are hand in hand, right? If you don't yeah. know to let go of doing the work, you never get the opportunity to, to delegate. And one of the things that people miss is that th there is a particular way to delegate effectively that 
is is actually really good for the per, the person you're delegating to. A lot of a lot of people really have a hard time feeling as though when they delegate, it's almost like they're giving up, <laughs> like they're doing something wrong. That they've they've hit a wall and they can no longer cope with the amount of work they've got. Then they should delegate, and that's not true. In 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 my experience, it's better to think first. Can I delegate this to someone when new work walks in your door? Because if someone can do something about 80% as well as you, chances are that's good enough, right? And that's an opportunity for someone to learn something. That's an opportunity for someone to grow. That's an opportunity for someone to take on more responsibility and strut their stuff and do good work. And that's all good. And through giving people an opportunity to do interesting work, you are developing them, which, by the way, is one of the most important things you can do as a manager or a leader. Not to mention the fact that if you're like most managers and leaders, you're already drowning in work that really, truly only you can do. I, I agree 100 percent. I think, um, you know, the best way to develop and grow your people is to stretch them in a certain way. You know, like if you think about if you want to grow your muscles, you're going to work them past the point that that's comfortable. You say you need mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. focus mm -hmm. on how can I. Uh, stretch the my team members in a way that's not hurtful. You know, you don't want to overdo it and hurt somebody, but you want to stretch them so that they can become comfortable with some of the uncomfort <laughs> that comes the, their way. Well, and delegation is probably the hardest thing for me. When, when I was there, I always thought, well, I can just do it better, so I'll just do it myself. And I didn't, it never came to that conclusion. I think you, you alluded to is that, you know, as one person, you can't scale and do the things as well as four or five people doing it at 80% of, of where you were. And, um, you know, it was really hard and painful for me to learn how to do that. But once I started to let things go, then I realized that my perception was way off. I thought I could do it better than everybody else. But then when I see the work that they're putting out and some of the creative solutions that come, <laughs> these people come up with, it's like, wow, they're, they're actually probably better than me. And I didn't right. even realize exactly. it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you kind of come at it with the mindset that their people's potential, hmm. generally speaking, is very, very, very high. Yeah. If you just give them the chance. Um, what's to say you are the, the the smartest person in the room when it comes to X? It's it's kind of it's kind of closed minded, isn't it? It's very it's, much it's, so. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, without realizing it, without intending it, it's you know, kind of a kind of an inflated ego. <laughs> it is exactly what it was. And uh, yeah. there's a really good book by Ron Holiday called uh, "Ego Is the Enemy." And uh, you know, coming up with that, they're thinking about that is like when I read that book, it, it really hit home that a lot of the things that I do at work or did at work were all because uh, I didn't want my ego to be bruised. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I didn't yeah. want someone else to be yeah. better. I, I got promoted. I'm the one that's supposed to be the best at this. Well, yeah, no, exactly. not really. Uh, yeah, we've got we've got a real a real problem with the hero culture in, mm, yes. in our line of work, and it's it's like when when things really go sideways, the person to step up and save the day, and you know, work twenty hour days, seven days a week to make it happen. That the thing is, that person gets celebrated. So that's what we look to say, okay, well, I guess, I guess you got to take the bull by the horns and, and make things happen and, and be, be the guy or be the girl. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's the self-perpetuating cycle. Um, you mentioned Ryan holiday. I, I, I just finished the obstacle is the way is uh, a, yes. a, a truly, a truly phenomenal read really, really good. So no, I'm glad, glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a good author. I've read a couple of his books. Um, Obstacles the way I've read that one. Um, what was his latest one? The Daily Stoic, I think, uh, something like that. Oh, okay, um, yeah. That he put together. It was really good as well. Um, but anyway, go, going back to engineering manager and um, and leading people, what is something that you need to start doing right away? You mentioned uh, delegation already and kind of letting go uh, as being some of the harder things to do. But what are some of the easy easy wins that an engineering uh, manager can do that will help put them on the right track forward to being that really good boss that that teams need? Yeah, uh, clarity is mm. is the word that comes to mind. And and when I when I say that, providing your people with a really clear sense of well, what are we here to do, you know, having really concrete goals, measurable goals, for the team, both in terms of their performance and what development looks like within your team. And and you know, I realize some people might be more in the project management, project lead, task lead type type world, and others might be more people management and, and, and development, that kind of thing. But broadly speaking, making it crystal clear what the goalposts are, helping people understand what does, what does high performance look like in this context. Hmm. And when you give that clarity, then that gives you something to check in on. 
right? I'm a big fan of, of regular one-on-ones with my teams. And besides just checking in, like to, to, to make sure that the other person is, is doing okay, just, <laughs> just for on a human perspective, um, it also provides an opportunity to check in, how are things going with this goal? Okay, how are we measuring progress toward that goal? Where are you today? Where were you last week? Where do you expect to be next week? And then those performance conversations get concrete. And what, one of the most important things that if, if, if people could walk away with only one lesson learned from this, I, I, I'd want it to be this, is that you manage performance. You don't manage people. You lead people, but you manage performance. Because when you try to manage people, when you try to tell them not just what to do, but how to do it, people get their backs up. Because for the most part, we're, we're talking about, we're, we're working with intelligent, hardworking professionals. So to try to manage their behavior is, is not generally going to work out so well. But you can manage concrete outcomes and progress toward those outcomes. And then you can be sitting side by side, side, side by side with your staff and looking collectively at the goal and saying, okay, how do we achieve this? Why aren't we getting there? Then it, then it becomes an objective conversation. And that's something anyone can do. Anyone can set goals and anyone can have those conversations. And, and I tell you, you'll benefit from engaging with your staff with that clarity and also avoid all sorts of the, the people challenges that come about as a result of poor performance by catching it early. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. I love the the concept of leading people and managing performance. I haven't heard it you know, put that way before. I think that's really good. Um, when it comes to managing performance, those regular one-on-one check-ins, how often do you recommend doing one of those? And kind of what's your format that, that you like to do one of those? It, it depends on the team. Uh, in the team of the project and the pace of the project, I've, mm -hmm. I've gone uh, as long as uh, a month between check-ins for, for a very large team on a relatively slow-moving project um, and as little as, as every week with every member of the team. And so mm -hmm. results may vary. Right, you've got to you've got to make that judgment call. But the format is um, basically the same, uh, re regardless of the uh, of the cadence. Is you're, you're making a half hour or an hour each uh, each session for each person on the team. You're checking in, and you are referring to a standing agenda that reflects the work that the person has been assigned. What's coming up next? How, how things have gone and whether or not there are any roadblocks. Mm -hmm. So you're always checking in. Basically that, that framework is around the goals and around those performance measures. So my expectation with my staff was always that they come to me ready to present their, their progress and their issues. And then we can brainstorm solutions together. Or if if the, if they're just looking to validate that their the, their plans are, are are okay, then that's great too. But that's the basic format. And then it sets the stage for the subsequent check in too, right? Is here's the overall goal. Here's where I expect to be the next time we get together. And and then the next time we get together, we'll already have that that framework in place. So it makes things very smooth and it keeps things pretty focused. The, the other thing that I like to do is uh, there's, there's a, really, a really great question that I think everyone should be asking their, their, their people on an individual basis is, what's on your mind? What's on your mind. Right? Very, very open. I want to know what that person is thinking. And then once they say what's on their mind, and may, you know, maybe it's nothing, maybe it's something in depth, um, and what else is important too. Because often there, often there is something just lurking below the surface that someone kind of needs teased out of them. Um, and it could be a problem someone's having at home, at work. It could be a challenge. It could be a desire that's never been expressed, whatever. Setting the stage to, to allow your people to table those, I think is, is very, very powerful. And the one-on-ones are, are a great time to do that. Yeah, I like that. And what else question? Um, and, you know, I always typically start out with, you know, what's going on? What's, you know, what are you thinking about? But the and what else? I like that because it digs it a little bit deeper and makes the person think about something other than the first surface answer that they're uh -huh. going to throw out anyway. So exactly. Like exactly. So tell me a little bit about the uh, uh, the engineering and leadership project. You talked about kind of why you started it and your passion behind it. Um, what exactly is it that, that you're doing over there? And tell me a little bit about, about the podcast that you started um, as well. Yeah, you bet. So 
the overall project is, is basically a way for uh, for me to encapsulate my work in 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 bringing <laughs> bringing engineering management to the people. Um, mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the work that I'm doing is is freely available. It's it's the the podcast which I started I started in 2015 and then went through a, a quiet period uh, when I realized that raising a newborn and working full time and pursuing an MBA was not the right time to have a podcast yeah. <laughs> that you've been doing this a long time, you know, it's how much work it is. Um, but the, the pandemic gave me a chance to, uh, to, to resurrect that and really double down on it. Um, but besides that, I do, I do webinars and I write. Um, but with the launch of this project, it's, it's provided the space to really double down on uh, helping people who want to go deeper with it through coaching, through courses, consulting, training, speaking, uh, it, it really creates the room to, to, to invest in that. So like I said, my, my goal is to make the vast majority of my material free. Uh, but for those who, you know, particularly from an organizational standpoint, if, if there's a, an organization or a company that uh, needs help with their management and bring people up to speed or, or, or going through some sort of onboarding process, that's a, that's a good way to, uh, uh, to, to provide that assistance. Um, so in the future, you know, my, my plans are to, uh, to I, I'm actually going to launch a, uh, a productivity course for engineering managers within the next month. Um, I suppose by the time this release, the, this gets aired, it'll, it'll have already been released. But um, uh, later on this year, I'm also going to have people management and project management courses for engineers as well. So lots to, lots to look forward to. Uh, you give me some teasers for that uh, productivity uh, courses. I might be interested in some tips or some, some ways to become more productive <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's something we, we all struggle with. Um, you're, you're just, as a manager, confronted with just more stuff. There are more inputs, yeah. more people reaching out, more emails, more meetings, more everything. So it's easy to get buried. So what I, what I teach with this, this productivity course is a, a framework I call the, the productivity pyramid. There, and there are three, three elements to productivity that I think people need to pay attention to. Most people already know about efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Doing things right, being, you know, uh, being faster, smarter, cleverer, that's a word, with the work you're doing. And, and when you look up productivity hacks uh, online, this is the kind of stuff that you often find. But I think that's only one part of, of the, the, uh, the overall picture. The other leg is effectiveness, which is doing the right thing in the first place. There's a really good quote from uh, Peter Drucker, who, who's the, the, the father of modern management theory. And he said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done in the first place. <laughs> yep. And we spend all sorts of time in our day-to-day -day work doing stuff that at the end of the day only matters so much. So being effective means understanding your goals, understanding your objectives, and making sure your work aligns with those goals and objectives. And one of the things I challenge people to do in the course is look at their goals and then look at all the meetings, teams, projects, commitments, whatever, and map. Do these actually help me achieve my goals? I think you'll find for most people, 50 to 60 to 70% of what they're working on does not, does not inch them toward their goals. So these are great candidates to have either someone else take care of or, or just leave alone altogether. The third yeah. leg of the pyramid is, uh, sorry, go for it. No, I was going to say, yeah, I've seen that too. I've seen so many times where you go to a place and you look at, you know, really evaluate how, what people are working on and you find out that they don't even know why they're doing the things that they're doing. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's remarkable because no, no, one, no one has asked them to stop and think about it. Right. Or, more, more often than not, there are no goals in place in the first place to evaluate against. Mm -hmm. The third leg of the pyramid is, is what I call systems. And by that, I mean, um, not just systems in kind of the systems engineering sense, but, but habits, processes, routines, those things that make being effective and efficient automatic so that you can sustain being productive in the long run and that you can absorb inputs that are, are going to come at you over the course of the year and that you know how to handle such that it doesn't derail you. So the, the course that, uh, that, that I've got really steps through the three legs and breaks that stuff down into 
really practical, really pragmatic stuff you can do. Like, for example, that work analysis, making sense of your commitments, aligning those to your goals and deciding, okay, now that I know that this has nothing to do with my work, <laughs> what, what do I do about this commitment? Right. Cool. And they'll be able to find your course on engineeringandleadership.com. Is that correct? Or Yep, that's right. There's a whole section that, that lists the course that uh, the courses that I provide. <laughs> Um, by the time that people listen to this, enrollment may or may not be open, but there's always a next cohort coming. Um, mm -hmm. And you can always, if it's not available in any in any particular moment, you can always sign up for the uh, uh, for the wait list. And I always notify people when uh, when new spots open up. Awesome, awesome. So, how can people connect with you online and learn more about uh, engineering and leadership and things that you guys are working on? Yeah, you bet. The, the very best place to go is uh, engineeringandleadership.com. Uh, I'm also super active on LinkedIn. So that's linkedin.com slash in slash Patrick Sweet. And you also find me on Twitter at Angelator. All right. And I'll link all that up in the show notes at geekleader.com as well. So people can link to you and find out, you know, um, the things that you're working on, listen to your podcast and hopefully take a course or two. So uh, yeah, you Pat, bet. that's great. <clears throat> thanks so much. I really appreciate having you on the show. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, sir. Had a blast. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some T-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.